the Medal of Honor was born out of America's gravest crisis, the Civil War. To recognize and honor the service men and women whose acts of valor in combat went above and beyond the call of duty. It is the nation's highest military honor. And on behalf of a grateful nation, we all want to thank you. Out of over 40 million veterans of war, just over 3,500 individuals have received this medal. Each one had a different story. No two were alike. For three World War II infantrymen who received their nation's highest honor, they had nothing in common, except that they all found themselves in the same place in the spring of 1944. June 6, 1944. Soldiers of the U.S. Army's 1st Infantry Division cram into their landing vessels. For days, these men have been floating off the southern coast of England, waiting for the order to dash across the English Channel to France and commence the invasion of German-occupied Western Europe. A faraway roar echoes across the Channel. It's the sound of Allied bombers swarming the French coast. The 1st Infantry is sealed aboard their landing vessels. They have their orders. Lieutenant Jimmy Monteith will lead his platoon in clearing exits off the beach. Technician 5th grade, Joe Pinder, will carry radio equipment to shore to establish vital communication. Private 1st Class Carlton Barrett will land ahead of his regiment and act as guide when they come to shore. These men are just a portion of the largest fleet assembled in human history. The goal is to establish a Western Front in Adolf Hitler's empire and eventually liberate Western Europe from Nazi tyranny. Monteith, Pinder, Barrett and the rest of the 1st Infantry are approaching the most heavily fortified section of the Normandy coast, Omaha Beach. Three German battalions have their guns zeroed in on Omaha Beach, waiting for the Allies to arrive. Through the artillery smoke and the early morning fog, soldiers begin to make out the shoreline. Their boats come under heavy fire. At 6.30 a.m., the first American forces land on Omaha Beach. Lieutenant Jimmy Monteith's boat runs aground 75 yards from the water's edge. The ramp drops down, but heavy enemy machine gun fire makes a frontal exit suicide. Monteith orders his men over the sides of the craft. No unit in the 1st Infantry lands where it is supposed to. Machine gun fire scatters confused soldiers. The ramp drops, and Joe Pinder lurches into waist-deep water, shouldering a large radio. He immediately sustains a shrapnel wound to the face, but keeps moving forward, carrying the radio set to shore. To set up radio communication, more equipment will be needed. Pinder heads back into the surf toward his landing craft. The beach is in total chaos. Poorly guided beach landings cluster soldiers together. German defenders concentrate their fire. Lieutenant Monteith must get his men moving, or they will be killed. But layers of heavy barbed wire stand in their way. Using a Bangalore torpedo, Monteith and his demolitions expert blow an opening in the German barbed wire. They push forward. Private First Class Carlton Barrett's assault boat strikes a sandbar 200 yards from shore. Infantrymen jump into neck-deep water. Their heavy equipment pulls them beneath the surface. Barrett makes it to shore safely, but sees many of his comrades hit by enemy fire or drowning under the weight of their gear. He plunges back into the water to save them. Joe Pinder slogs through the surf 
returning to his half-sunken craft for vital radio equipment. On his third trip, a burst of bullets cuts through the water and into his side. Undaunted, Pinder comes to shore. He refuses medical attention and begins assembling the equipment to establish radio communication with headquarters, all the while losing blood. Pinder is hit for a third time and killed. But he had established vital radio communication. Navy gunners waiting patiently offshore finally receive target coordinates from the beach. Navy guns zero in on German pillboxes that have been cutting down the 1st Infantry. Lieutenant Monteith's platoon has advanced through two minefields, but is under heavy machine gun fire. Monteith bangs on the sides of two Allied tanks and leads them to firing positions. The tanks knock out three strategic enemy positions that have been firing on the Americans below for over two hours. Americans start to make advances up and down the beach. Private Carlton Barrett struggles to bring wounded and drowning infantrymen to shore. The surf is congested with landing craft. Some have run aground, others damaged by artillery fire. But through the chaos, Barrett spots an evacuation boat. With no regard for his own safety, he carries wounded infantrymen out for evacuation. Scrambling up the beach exit, Monteith and his men have pushed 200 yards inland. A large force of Germans, outnumbering the Americans three to one, surrounds Monteith's platoon with the hope of taking back the high ground. Armed with a Thompson submachine gun, Monteith repeatedly moves from position to position risking his own safety to strengthen links in his defensive chain. His platoon beats back multiple enemy counterattacks. On the beach, Carlton Barrett is running dispatches between advancing assault units. He has been shot and hit with shrapnel in both legs, but does not stop. He flags down the boats of his regiment and guides them to proper landing places. Barrett is hit again. This time it's shrapnel shattering his left foot. Like the many men he had helped, Barrett needs evacuation. Further inland, Monteith and his men hold off a fourth enemy assault. A sergeant in his platoon said of Monteith, that guy doesn't know the meaning of the word fear. While sprinting across an open field to bring support to his platoon's opposite flank, First Lieutenant Monteith is gunned down by machine gun fire. His platoon holds their ground and continues to fight. Nearly five hours of some of the most intense fighting of World War II has elapsed. It isn't until 1.30 p.m. that news reaches the 1st Infantry leadership that troops are advancing up the heights behind the beaches. Soldiers have cleared draws through minefields and barbed wire and are starting to take out German positions on the cliffs that hours earlier seemed impenetrable. Because of the leadership of Monteith, Pinder, Barrett, and other brave men like them, the Americans start to advance inland. By the end of the day, the majority of German positions on Omaha Beach have been taken. The Americans have prevailed, but at a terrible cost. D-Day was a critical turning point in World War II. 2,500 U.S. soldiers were killed. It was the first day of many terrible days to come. At Aachen, the Hürgen Forest, and Baston, to name but a few. For the Nazis and the Axis powers, it was the beginning of the end. For their actions, Monteith, Pinder, and Barrett each received the Medal of Honor. Jimmy Monteith was buried not far from where he fell, at the American Cemetery. John J. Pinder's remains were returned home for burial.
Private First Class Carlton Barrett is evacuated to England. When asked about his actions on that day, Barrett humbly replied, I don't think I deserve any more credit than anyone else who was on the beach on D-Day. I acted instinctively. I didn't think things out because there wasn't time. I did what I'd been taught to do. The infantry is a team, you know, and I was just doing my job as a member of the team. Barrett lost a leg in later years, complications of the wounds he had suffered. He made a rare public appearance in 1984 as the guest of honor at a parade commemorating the 40th anniversary of D-Day. He said of that parade that it was a pretty nice day. With the passing of Woody Williams, there are no more living Medal of Honor recipients from the Second World War. President Franklin Roosevelt said it best of these men on the evening after D-Day. They are drawn from the ways of peace. They fight to end conquest. They fight to let justice arise. They yearn but for the end of battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. <laughs>